Hi, everyone. Uh, this is overview and state of Linkerd. So welcome. Um, so I'm going to just start with a show of hands. Sorry to do this. But who here has heard the word service mesh before? Should be everyone, because I just said it. Uh, who could explain what a service mesh is? Okay, about half the people, maybe. Who has used a service mesh before? More people, somehow. <laughs> uh, who's using a service mesh in production? That's still a good number. What about who's using Linkerd in production? Oh, still, still pretty good. I have to ask this to stroke my ego. Uh, yeah, so speaking of my ego, uh, my name is Alex. I am a Linkerd maintainer. Uh, I've been working on Linkerd since the beginning of Linkerd. I'm very proud to be part of the project. Uh, Linkerd is a very cool project. Uh, it's used by a lot of different uh, organizations all over the world and has been for a long time. Uh, it's, uh, we have a very vibrant open source community, so if you ever pop into the Linkerd Slack or go onto GitHub, you'll see lots of issues, lots of pull requests, lots of activity, people helping each other in Slack. It's, uh, it's, really, it's really nice. Uh, we're a CNCF project. We are a graduated project, um, and uh, we're very proud to be there. Uh, so what does Linkerd do? So Linkerd is a service mesh, for, for those who were, uh, said they were not able to explain what a service mesh is. Uh, a service mesh, or in our case, or as we use the term, means that there is a sidecar proxy in every pod, or in every pod that's part of the service mesh, and all network traffic uh, for that pod that is either leaving the pod or coming in is redirected and intercepted by that proxy. And that proxy handles that traffic and is able to add a bunch of functionality there like observability, so you can get things like uh, golden metrics uh, for request rate, success rate, latency, et cetera. Uh, you can see your uh, service topology because you know who is calling who. Um, you can get reliability features like retries and timeouts, load balancing, traffic shifting, A-B deploys, um, latency aware load balancing, which is a really neat feature. So you can shift traffic automatically to replicas that are being faster and shift it away from replicas that are being slower. Um, and then, perhaps the most important thing, uh, transparent MTLS between all services on by default. So this is the thing that people are usually uh, most interested in, or, or a lot of people kind of come to Linkerd or a service mesh for first, is they want MTLS, and they don't want to work for it. They just want to install Linkerd and have it work, which is, which is what we do. Um, and of course, you can do things like cert management and rotation and um, access policy, which I will talk more about in a little bit. Um, and I meant to say this earlier, but actually, the way I want to do this talk is I want to talk about what is new in Linkerd, what is coming up soon on the roadmap, but I want to get through all of that kind of as quickly as I can to leave a lot of time, if possible, for questions. Because uh, I really want this to be a little more interactive and to hear what you all want to know about Linkerd and, and hopefully answer that. So if we get to the end and there's no questions, that will be very awkward for me. Okay, so, so what's the kind of the philosophy behind Linkerd? Um, Linkerd has gone through a, a couple of iterations. There was a previous version of Linkerd called Linkerd 1, which was written on the JVM, and we learned a lot of things from that. It was very, very powerful, very, very configurable. Uh, and while that was really awesome, it was also very hard to use, and a lot of people you know, who were trying to use it kind of had the experience of like, well, you know what we're trying to do. Why, why doesn't it just work? Why do I have to configure all of this stuff? And so we took a lot of those lessons into, into what we sometimes call Linkerd2, or we've kind of dropped the two, we just call it Linkerd now. Um, and the idea is that it should just work right out of the box for 99.9% .9 of use cases. You should be able to just install it, and it should do the right thing. Um, and you know, anything that needs user input or needs user configuration should kind of come after that. Uh, you shouldn't have that as an as a upfront uh, barrier to getting started. The other big philosophy that we had for this project was for it to be really, really lightweight and really, really low uh, resource utilization. So that's why we wrote uh, a proxy from scratch. We're not using Envoy or any other kind of off-the-shelf proxy for Linkerd. We have a proxy called the Linkerd2 proxy. It's written in Rust, and it's designed to be as lightweight and fast as possible. Um, and operational simplicity has kind of been like one of the most important things 
from the beginning is that this should not only be easy to get started with and easy to install, but also easy to operate over time and easy to reason about and easy to know what's happening in your system without having to understand a lot of kind of black magic or, or weird you know, things that are happening. Uh, so like I mentioned, we use a specially built microproxy. Uh, it's very boring to anyone who operates it, which is the goal. It's called the Linkerd2 proxy. Um, and it's, uh, it's something we're really proud of. It's kind of one of the most invisible parts of the service mesh because as an operator, you should never have to worry about it. Uh, but it's got some very, very cool technology under the hood. It's, it's written in Rust on some like cutting edge uh, libraries that we helped develop like Tokyo and Hyper and H2 and Tower. Um, and you know, because it's written in Rust, we get a lot of security benefits from that as well. We don't have to worry about certain classes of, of memory issues. Um, but as I said, like the, the philosophy is that the proxy should be an implementation detail. It's not something that we ever think a operator should have to worry about. And so this kind of leads into uh, our philosophy on security. Uh, we want to you know, have secure foundations. We want to be built on secure libraries in secure languages. And we want to leverage Kubernetes as much as possible and be Kubernetes native as much as possible. So that means, for example, when we're doing MTLS, all of the uh, MTLS identities are bootstrapped from Kubernetes service accounts. And so that's kind of the primitive that we, we built everything on top of. And uh, in order to be secure, you really need to reduce the barriers to security because security features that nobody uses are not useful. Uh, so MTLS is on by default. There's nothing you need to do to configure it because we know you've got a service account. That's your credential to getting a certificate. Once you've got a certificate, you can do MTLS. And so we have workload identity, and all this stuff just kind of works without needing any special configuration. Uh, this is what people like to ask us about all the time, is what's the difference between Linkerd and Istio, and, and how do the two compare? I don't want to go through all of these points, um, especially because these two projects are both uh, changing at rapid paces. So you know, anything that's true here one day might not be true the next. Uh, but I think like the biggest difference is just in philosophy, in that you know the Linkerd project is really really focused on operability and simplicity, uh, rather than trying to satisfy every use case under the sun, and I think that's what makes it easier to use. It what what makes people have more confidence in it, and it's what uh, means it can go to production faster. Um, there's also a lot of performance benefits I think to using the Linkerd and the Linkerd proxy. Uh, we've done some really interesting benchmarks, which uh, you can look up if you're interested. Okay, so what's new in the project over the past eh, year or so? Uh, so Linkerd 2.11 was a really exciting release. Uh, I forget when this came out, but some, sometime in the last year. Um, and this is when we first added um, server-side authorization. So, you know, we've had MTLS for a long time, which has given us authentication. We know when one service calls another, we know who that is. They have an identity. That identity is bootstrapped from the service account. Uh, and so we know, you know, we know who is calling who. But for the first time in 2.11, we gave you the ability to restrict who you would accept requests from. So the service could say, I would only like to accept requests from this other service, or I would only like to request uh, accept requests from this other subnet, you know, or some combination thereof. And so finally, there was fine grain access control, and you could start implementing those, those policies, which a lot of people were asking for and are very, very useful. Um, and it, this took us a while to kind of figure out what model we wanted to use here. Um, we wanted to do it in a way that was Kubernetes native and felt natural to people who were in Kubernetes and didn't have to be a whole new system that people had to learn kind of on top of, of what they already knew. Um, so we introduced a new resource type called server. Uh, this lets you define you know, a specific port on your workload. Um, and as soon as you have a server, then you can start to define authorizations to say, here are the identities which are allowed to access this server. And that's all enforced on the server side. Uh, so it's very secure. And again, because we have the sidecar model where we have proxies inside the pod, each pod kind of becomes its own uh, trust barrier. And it can say, it can decide for itself, you know, what traffic it's deciding to accept and, and what it's not. 
based on those policies. Um, there were a bunch of other things in that uh, release which were really exciting. Uh, specifically, uh, a gRPC retries was uh, something that was a long term coming, a long time coming. So we've had retries in Linkerd for a long time, but they've been very uh, restricted in type in terms of what types of requests can be retried. So specifically, anything with a body, uh, we were never able to retry before because we would have to buffer that body uh, so that if that request eventually fails, we would have that body so we could send it again. Um, so that buffering was something we added in 2.11 so that for, for gRPC requests in particular, where there's always a body on the request, uh, we could retry those uh, up to a maximum payload, yeah, 64K. So we'll buffer a certain amount. And this is another philosophy about, about Linkerd is that, and something that we get kind of from working in Rust, is we get to make very conscious decisions about uh, how much uh, data we're buffering in the proxy. You know, we have fixed size queues. We know that uh, we can uh, decide how much we want to buffer and how much we want to use uh, things like back pressure to push, uh, push stuff back and make sure that we're not growing our resource uh, usage beyond what's acceptable. Uh, we also made a bunch of performance improvements, and we're always kind of having one eye on performance to make sure that we're not, you know, having anything run away. Um, and, and a lot of other cool features, too. Um, the other big thing that happened in 2.11 is that we, we changed the control plane architecture a little bit in that we added a new uh, piece of it called the policy controller. And the policy controller is very important for... Um, serving the policy API, which, which allows all that server-side policy uh, access control that I just talked about. But what's exciting here is the policy was our first controller, which was written in Rust. So before this, all of the control plane was written in Go, and the proxy was written in Rust. And so this was the first time we had Rust kind of entering the control plane side of things. Uh, and this, I think, is a very, very exciting development because we got to kind of try out uh, what it was like to write a controller in Rust you know, typically, these are written in Go. There's a lot of Go ecosystem around Kubernetes controllers. There's a lot of really good libraries for writing controllers in Go. Uh, but that ecosystem on the Rust side is really starting to develop now. And it was, you know, I worked a bit on that, that policy control, and it was a joy to write, actually. Uh, I was dreading a little bit when, when I first got started, because I'm like, oh, man, writing a controller in Rust is going to be a nightmare. But it was great. So I think those libraries have really matured a lot. And uh, I'm excited to kind of, as we develop more things in the control plane, to do more and more of it in Rust. So I think that's really, really exciting. Uh, okay, so fast forward uh, to 2.12, which is the most recent release of, of Linkerd. Uh, this kind of took the server-side authorization a step farther. So one of the big drawbacks with the uh, server-side authorization that we had in 2.11 is that uh, all the authorization, we said it was fine-grained, but it was fine-grained per server, which meant per port. So you could say, you know, this port has this policy, this port has this policy, these are the types of requests that it'll accept, and here's who it'll accept it from. Uh, but what we really found is that we needed to get even more fine-grained than that and have per route policy, which meant to take a look at the HTTP path or method and decide, you know, is this a liveness check, if so, it needs a different authorization, you know, policy than if this is, you know, uh, scraping the metrics or if this is an application request or if this is something else. So people ran into a lot of problems specifically with uh, liveness probes because those were coming from the kubelet. They were not authenticated. They were not part of the mesh. Uh, so in a lot of cases, we were rejecting them because people set up, you know, their, their servers and their authorization policies and uh, those liveness probes were failing, and then the application was failing because it was detected as down. Uh, so this kind of helped clean that up a lot and meant that we can now do authorization per route. And we could say this route, uh, you know, these, these clients can talk to this route, and these clients can talk to this route, and, and it gives us a lot more control. Uh, so that's been a huge step forward. The other reason why this is really exciting is because when we were developing this feature, we needed some way for uh, people to specify which routes you know, were, were allowed and which routes were not. So we needed users to have some way to specify what is a route. And it turns out that similar work was already happening at the same time in the Gateway API, where as part of the Gateway API for ingresses, you also need to define what is a route. 
And uh, this was a really good opportunity because we could use those types and we could kind of make sure that we were developing this in a direction that was compatible with what Kubernetes was doing and what, what, what the gateway API was doing. Um, and so that's what we did. We used the gateway API type, the HTTP route type from the gateway API to define HTTP routes and you can attach server policy onto those in Linkerd. So you can say, here's an HTTP route uh, and you know, when talking to this server on this route, here's the authorization policy that you should use. And I think this sets us up uh, in a good direction because um, right now there's ongoing work on the Gamma project, which is a project to adapt the, um, the Gateway API for service meshes in general. So this is obviously something that's of, of quite a bit of interest to us. And uh, it means that we're kind of well set up to be compatible with that. And we're very involved in, in that conversation. So uh, the Gateway API is very cool if you have not checked it out. Uh, I'm doing a talk tomorrow uh, about the, uh, the Gateway API and specifically how Linkerd uses it. So if you're interested in hearing more about that, I will be talking about that tomorrow. Uh, but in the meantime, just know it's very, very cool. Uh, what else? Oh yeah, and we also added kind of automatic uh, support for health checks. So that means that even if you don't manually configure that you know, these are the paths for, uh, that you've defined as health checks, we will admit those automatically because we know what they are because they're in your uh, spec, they're in your, your container spec, and we know those are coming from the kubelet, so as long as they're coming from the right place, we don't require MTLS on them and, and that'll just work. So that's been a big quality of life improvement there. Okay, so what's coming up next in the future? Um, so Linkerd 2.13 uh, will be our next release. I don't know exactly when uh, it's planned to come out, you know, when it's ready. Um, but the major focus for 2.13 is going to be client-side policy. So in 2.12 and 2.11, the major focus was on server-side policy, uh, specifically admission policy. We wanted to say, you know, we're going to let these things in or, or we're going to deny them based on their identity. On 2.13, we really want to focus on uh, client-side policy. Uh, and there's a few things, client-side policy is a very, very broad topic. There's a lot of things in there. But uh, specifically, we wanted to focus on uh, header-based routing and circuit breaking in particular. Um, these are two features that are, have been highly, highly requested. Uh, and so, you know, it's the natural time to kind of take what we learned doing server policy and, and move that over to the client side. So again, we want to continue the, the path that we've gone on using the HTTP route type from the Gateway API and, and potentially other types from the Gateway API to do this in a way that feels very Kubernetes native and Kubernetes very natural to anybody who's running in Kubernetes. Uh, so for example, HTTP routes have these things called backends or backend refs, which are very useful for ingresses because as an ingress, you want to say, okay, for this route, here's where I'm going to send this request to. Um, in the same way, it's kind of also natural to use that for east-west traffic when saying, well, when I send a request that matches this route to this service, um, you know, actually, I want to send it to this other backend instead, or I want to split it and send a portion of that traffic to this backend instead, or I want to split it based on a header and say, for this header, I want it to go here, and this header, I want it to go here. So that's something we're working on uh, right now uh, that's very, very exciting. Um, we've also had a lot of requests for circuit breaking. This is a kind of, this is an interesting one and a little bit of a nebulous one because everybody who asks for circuit breaking means something different by it. Uh, so we're never quite sure exactly what that means. But I think in general, there's this need to do, um, to specify load balancer policy. And load balancer policy en encompasses a lot of things. So for Linkerd right now, what we do is we do uh, this load balancing algorithm called EUMA, E-W-M-A, Exponentially Weighted Moving Average, uh, which is a very, very cool algorithm that takes a look at historical uh, latency data and uses that to weight how much traffic should go to each backend. So if you see some backends are performing very well, they'll get more traffic. Other backends which are performing more poor, poorly, they'll get less traffic, and that will kind of automatically adjust uh, over time as the performance of those backends changes over time. Um, and it's really, really good at minimizing latency. Uh, so that's what we use in 100% of cases, we always use Yuma. Uh, and it performs great, but 
there's kind of this, this desire for some people to say, well, actually I want a little more input on how load balancing happens. I want to do, um, I want to have more control over when uh, backends are, are in the pool or out of the pool. And this is kind of the, the, what people call circuit breaking to say, well, there's a bunch of, been a bunch of failures on this backend. Maybe I want to kick that out of the load balancer pool for a while, let that backend recover before I bring it back in. Um, and so there's a lot of surface area here for configuration to say, well, exactly how do you want load balancing to behave? And so client policy is a really natural place for users to be able to specify that configuration and say, well, maybe we need different policies for different routes. Maybe this route is fundamentally, you know, behaves differently and it needs a different load balancer policy than, than this other one. Maybe we want circuit breaking over here, but we don't want it over here because, you know, the nature of those services is different. Um, now, if you are a Linkerd expert, uh, you may recognize that some of this sounds kind of familiar from service profiles. So service profiles are, are something that's in Linkerd today, and it's a way of specifying which routes are retriable and which routes have timeouts. Uh, and, it, you know, that's got a lot of overlap with what I just talked about, being able to specify client policy, because retries and timeouts are client policy. Um, and so kind of because there's this overlap, we want to kind of start slowly to move away from service profiles for configuring these, these things and start moving towards something that feels more natural in Kubernetes, which is by doing things with HTTP routes and with the gateway API. So this isn't going to be a hard cut over. Uh, we're going to kind of slowly start to deprecate things from service profiles and move them over to the new, the new world of, of uh, HTTP routes and, and, and gateway API, um, just because that feels a lot more, a lot more Kubernetes-y. Uh, and so we'll kind of slowly, slowly migrate that functionality over, um, kind of over time. And, you know, as I said before, we've got our eye on Gamma, where we're very involved in those conversations, and uh, to the extent possible, we want to be compatible with Gamma. We want to have all that uh, server-side and client-side functionality be configured in a way that, that makes sense uh, with the Gateway API. Uh, so if this sounds interesting, uh, we would love for you to get involved. Um, all the development is open source, of course, on GitHub, so you can kind of follow along, you can file issues, you can open PRs. Uh, if you are trying to run Linkerd and you run into any problems, you can always hop into the Linkerd Slack, slack.linkerd.io, and there's always people, maintainers and other users who are there uh, helping each other out and just being friendly and nice. Uh, we've got some mailing lists that are, that are from the CNCF that we announce releases to and, and uh, make other announcements to. Uh, there have been some security audits that we've done, which are very interesting if you care to read security audits. Um, and yeah, we would love to, uh, love to have everyone participate. Um, if you are looking for a more kind of hands-on way of learning about Linkerd, there is a uh, hands-on Service Mesh Academy uh, the next one is in November, um, and that really gets you kind of hands-on and uh, teaches you right down to the nitty-gritty uh, the details about Linkerd that you uh, might not be able to, to pick up on your own. So if that is of interest to you, I highly recommend that you check it out. Uh, and if you are running uh, Linkerd in, in production, and you need a little bit of extra help or you want to alleviate some of that uh, burden of, uh, of running it, uh, Buoyant offers a fully managed Linkerd. So it will take care of things like automatic upgrades and uh, certificate rotation and alerts and stuff like that, uh, which just takes some of the administrative burden off of you and you know, uh, makes it a little bit easier, gives you one less thing to, to worry about. So uh, buoyant.io slash demo if you're interested in getting a demo of that. Okay, so hopefully I, I went fast enough there to, to leave a lot of time for, for questions. Um, and I want to know what you want to know about Linkerd. Uh, so Istio is going to have something like a proxyless mode using mm -hmm. ambient mesh. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any plans uh, along those lines? Anything? Yeah, good Proxilous. question. Yes, the question was, um, 
Istio's got an ambient proxyless mode. Is Linkerd ever going to have something like that? Probably not. Uh, so we're really tied to the sidecar model. We think it has a lot of advantages uh, in terms of security and in terms of operability and, and understandability. The pod is a very natural security boundary. And so when you do something with like ambient where you take that, that proxy and you run it somewhere else uh, and you have it kind of be multi-tenant, uh, you lose a lot of those, those benefits and you, you've got one proxy serving multiple different pods. Uh, those security boundaries get a little bit more muddled. You know, you have uh, keys from multiple different uh, accounts potentially uh, coexisting in that one proxy. Uh, so we don't see kind of any major advantages to that, that, that sidecarless model that kind of outweigh, outweigh the drawbacks. So we're, we're, we're probably in it with the sidecar for, for at least the medium to long term. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So the, uh, someone just pointed out that Linkerd one had that architecture, and that's true. Uh, Linkerd one had a per node proxy. And you know, one of the lessons that we learned from that was that there's a lot of drawbacks to that. And it's very difficult to do security uh, correctly in that model. And it's very difficult. You know, it introduces a lot of complexity uh, that you can uh, drop if you go to this more isolated model of, of proxy per pod. Uh, hi. Uh, we've been running Linkerd in production since 2020, um, but we're on 2.9, mm -hmm. and it's hard to upgrade. Like it's it's like a one-way upgrade, and for production workloads, um, it's very hard to guarantee that like we can revert if there's a problem, especially since you have to like rotate everything to get. Do you have any recommendations? Like for us right now, the plan is like to safely upgrade or to, to a new version is to have a separate cluster, like a, cause it's a separate cluster that's running the exact same workloads, the same network, but it's got a different Linkerd and your one. And then if something goes back, we just switch over and network to the older cluster. Yeah, yeah, so the question is, is how do you, how do you upgrade in, in a way that you have confidence that you can, can roll back? And in, I, I, I hear that it has been an issue in the past that uh, rollbacks to a previous version have been very, very, very difficult. We're trying to get better about that kind of going forward, um, but it is, you know, historically a problem. Um, my advice to you is if you're running into problems, just try and engage with the Linkerd team, you know, directly we can try and help you sort out, you know, the specifics. Um, but uh, yeah, going, going backwards, doing a downgrade has not been something that has been a great experience in the past, so I hear that. So um, obviously, the, with the new server-side policies, you can enforce security within Linkerd. Um, is there a security reason to do both? Um, you know, is it, I know you're enforcing a proxy, but is it, you know, a concern that we should apply it on both sides? You know, potentially, if we have pods that we don't want anything talking to, do you need to do it twice, or is, it, is one good enough? It's a question about whether you would also do kind of security in the application as well? No, I mean on like the firewall level. So you could do it on the on the Linkerd level and on the firewall level, you know, through the CNI type deal. I see, I see. Yeah, I mean, you could. It's kind of like a belt and suspenders type of approach. They're they're slightly different things. You know, when Linkerd talks about uh, security and, and MTLS, what we're talking about is workload identity. So we have these identities which are tied to certificates, which are bootstrapped from from uh, service account tokens. So you know. We don't necessarily say that, you know, this request is, uh, you know, coming from a certain place, but rather it has this identity, this cryptographic identity, which represents this workload. And so, you know, if you want another layer on top of that or below that, uh, that can potentially make sense as well. It's kind of just a different, it's a different layer and it's a different thing. Um, for the cryptographic identity and the and the certificates, are, how are you guys issuing that? Is it through an Acme? Uh, do you link into like an Acme provider using Cert Manager, or are you handling that entirely within Linkerd? Uh, it's by default, it's handled entirely by Linkerd. We do integrate with Cert Manager. So, for example, if you want automatic certificate rotation, Cert Manager can do that, and uh, that works great. In the default case, we generate all of that, uh, all of those certificates uh, inside of Linkerd. And those are, you know, kind of bootstrapped up from the service account tokens, but that trust chain is kind of all, you know, all there. It's not connected to 
like a well-known CA or anything like that. Okay, so if you wanted to operate like your own Acme compliance CA and hook it into Cert Manager, would you still be able to get the same like identity management yep. and rotation? Yep, yep, you can supply your own trust root, your own Cert Manager, and that'll all kind of get hung off of that. Cool, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, it was great. Um, so I'm a longtime Istio user, but also a fan of Linkerd personally. Um, so one of the things that I was looking at is in terms of like day two operations, in terms of visibility, Istio, for example, makes it very easy to do something like Kiali. Is there something in the community that's equivalent inside the Linkerd community or is there an opportunity, is that something as a community we should like look at or in terms of viewing, you know, traffic routing inside the cluster? Yeah, so a lot of that is kind of built into the Linkerd Viz extension. You know, if you use the Linkerd Viz extension, you can get things like service maps and dashboards and, and so on. Uh, so a lot of the functionality that's in, in Kiali is also kind of available through, through the Linkerd dashboard. Um, but kind of on top of that, all of that data is in Prometheus, and you can build, you know, any visualization, visualization you want on top of that. Uh, two quick questions. You mentioned that the control plane was down to three components, but I counted five on the slide. So are there some doubling up there? Uh, and Let's take a look. Let's see whether I'm wrong or the diagram's wrong. Um, so the destination and policy controllers, they're, they're split out here, but they're in one. They're kind of bundled together in one pod. The public API doesn't exist anymore. And that's three. So the slide is slightly wrong. Okay. Uh, yeah, the slides would be old because also I think your Twitter handle was wrong on there. Oh, was it? Um, but I, I found you and I followed you anyway. Um, the other one you mentioned briefly, you had something about back pressure. Does, does Linkerd provide a back pressure mechanism? Yes, that's a great question. Cool. Uh, so for back pressure, you know, we, uh, we use kind of the HTTP back pressure mechanism. So uh, as uh, kind of the proxy uh, handles traffic, it, it, it takes those bytes in and it sends them out. And as soon as it sends them out, it kind of signals, you know, upstream that it's ready for more kind of using the natural connection windows of HTTP. Hi. Um, so I'm interested in uh, Linkerd's, uh, so I, I, talking about your authorization policies, it's on a pod-to-pod -pod kind of uh, this workload authorization. Mm -hmm. um, does Linkerd have a story around like user authorization between pods or, or accessing services or endpoints in uh, Pods are maybe further down the stack that a gateway wouldn't be able to necessarily block that traffic? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, so we've always kind of been focused on, on workload identity rather than user identity. Um, I think that may change a little bit in the future as we start to take on more ingress functionality. Um, I think that's a more natural place for that. Uh, but kind of for now, all of the east-west stuff is all uh, workload off. Uh, yeah, sure, I can take this one and then. Uh, yeah, the question was, uh, can you explain the difference between east-west and north-south traffic? North-south generally refers to uh, stuff coming in from the outside world, so coming in through the ingress of the gateway, and then east-west is service to service within the cluster, so one service in the cluster to another service also in the cluster. Uh, so sim similar to the question that he asked, like, is there any plan to, I guess, work with some something like Open Policy Agent to have, like, data policies on uh, service to service traffic? Uh, yeah, potentially. I mean, it, there aren't any kind of plans right now, but uh, Open Policy Agent is something we've looked at in the past and it's very interesting and it's definitely potentially useful for a lot of stuff, uh, but we don't have anything concrete right now. Can you say anything about the communication between your data plane and control plane? So, for example, in Istio, they use something called XTS mm -hmm. because that's what Envoy exposes. Yep. But I guess, I don't know, can you say anything about what kind of protocol you use? Sure. Uh, so the question was about what's, what's the, how does the communication between the control plane and the data plane work? Um, you know, conceptually, it's very similar to the XDS APIs from Envoy, but it's, it's a separate uh, gRPC API. So control plane, each of the control plane components exposes some gRPC API, um, and the, uh, the proxies connect to the control plane to, to get that information. So conceptually, very similar to XDS, but a different thing. Okay, I think that's uh, I think that's time. Thank you everybody. Uh, I'll be hanging out if you want to ask me more questions. <laughs>